because he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's interesting, in these first few chapters of Revelation, John kind of sets the stage for the big picture of what's about to unfold. And in chapter 4, we discover we worship God because He is the Creator. But in chapter 5, He gives us the second reason why we worship God. Not only is he the creator, but in chapter 5, verse 6, as John is looking at the throne, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Poor, pitiful, bleeding, slain lamb standing in the center of God's throne. And all the living creatures around the throne sang a new song in verse 9. They sang, You are worthy because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God. And in a loud voice, verse 12, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Worthy is the Lamb to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped the Lamb who was slain. We worship God because He is the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And we worship God because He is our Redeemer who came and gave His life to save us. God gave us a monument a memorial to remind us that He is the Creator. And likewise, He gave us a monument, a memorial to remind us that He is our Savior, that He died on the cross, that He was buried in the grave and rose up again in victory to save you and me. He gave us a monument to remind us of that event. What is it? That monument is baptism. Matthew chapter 28, in the 28th chapter of Matthew, the very last words that Matthew recorded of Jesus before he ascended into heaven, his last words for his church before he went to heaven, Jesus said in verse 18, he came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now remember in Revelation chapter 13, the dragon gave his authority to the beast. But Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what authority did the dragon give to the beast? Nothing. It is a counterfeit and to acknowledge his authority is to disacknowledge. Is that a word? <laughs> if it wasn't, it is now, because that's what I want to say. To acknowledge his authority is to disacknowledge the authority of Jesus Christ, because all authority has gone to him. Now, watch. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them 
to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Go and baptize them. You see, baptism was so important to Jesus that he included it among his very last words to the church before he ascended to heaven. And along with baptism is the promise that if we baptize and teach people what it means to be baptized, teach them all that he has commanded us, then he says, I will be with you all the way through till the end of the age. That means that if you want to know the secret to victory, then baptism plays an important role to give us victory over the beast all the way through to the end time. And I'm not interested in just telling you who the beast is. I'm not interested in just helping you understand the book of Revelation. I want you to be victorious. I want you to be standing on that sea of glass singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. It's not enough to know about it. Folks, we need to experience it. And that's why I take these little side excursions that may seem as though they're not related to the book of Revelation, but once you step back and see that big picture, then you'll understand and it all becomes so clear. Baptism is mentioned 80 times in the New Testament. And yet in spite of that, there is a lot of confusion even in the Christian world today over baptism. How should a person be baptized? When should a person be baptized? How many times should a person be baptized? Does God recognize all forms of baptism? I want to answer those questions. I think they're important. And I want to start with the last one. Does God recognize all forms of baptism? Turn to the little book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. So I want you to tell me, how many lords are there? One. How many hopes are there? One. How many faiths are there? How many baptisms are there? One. Now, he's not saying that a person can only be baptized one time. No, that's not what he's saying. Because I'll show you later some examples of Paul encountering people that had been baptized and they didn't fully understand what it meant. And so he taught them, just like Jesus said, and then he baptized them again. So that tells me that it's not wrong to be baptized more than once. Sometimes people are baptized and they fall away, far away from the path like I did. And then when I came back, I wanted to start over. I wanted a clean slate. I wanted to be baptized again. And I was baptized again. And I praise God for that. That was an important step for me to take. So no, it's not wrong to be baptized more than once. Usually, once is enough. But sometimes people are baptized without knowing what they really meant. Or maybe they just went along with the crowd. Or maybe they weren't even old enough to understand. One fellow I asked him, I said, you baptized? He said, I don't know. My mama said I was, but I don't remember. <laughs> well, baptism is important. No, he's not saying you can only be baptized one time. What he's saying is that God only recognizes one baptism. And that's the only baptism that's ever practiced in the Christian church for the first 500 years of her existence, and that is baptism by immersion underneath the water. In fact, that's exactly what baptism means. Baptism is really a Greek word, baptize. It's a Greek word. We get it from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo means to immerse to bury under the water. That's the meaning of the word. 
to immerse, to put under the water. It wasn't even a religious word in Bible times. It was just a common, ordinary word. Immerse, baptize. If you were living in Bible times and you were a lady that wanted to dye a piece of cloth, you would say, well, I'm going to baptize this cloth in the water. Now, it doesn't do to just sprinkle a drop or two on the cloth. You need to put it underneath the surface and get it good and immersed in the dye. Or, if you're one who likes to dunk your donuts, <laughs> yeah, you would say, I'm going to baptize my donut. Now, any donut dunker worth his weight in salt knows that sprinkling a drop or two on there, no, oh, that's not going to get it. What do you do? You got to stick it down in there, get it good and soaked. Now you have dunked it. Now you have baptized it. Because that's exactly what the word meant, to immerse. So when you see and hear Jesus saying, go and baptize them, he's really saying, go and immerse them. And that's the way you should read it. Well, why doesn't it say that in the Bible? Because by the time the Bible was written, tradition, there's that word again, tradition had taken over. And they were not baptizing by immersion anymore. They were sprinkling. It was a tradition. So the translators came to this word. Jesus said, go and baptizo. <laughs> they should have translated it, immerse. Oh, but we can't do that because we're not doing that. So what are we going to do? So the translators did a little linguistic trick. Instead of translating the word baptizo, they transliterated the word. Well, what's the difference? In translating, you look at a word in one language and find another word in the other language that says the exact same thing, as close as you can get, and you put that word in there. So when they saw baptizo, they should have put immerse. That would have been translating it. But they couldn't translate it. Transliterating means that instead of translating it and putting what it means, you substitute the letters for the new language. For example, in baptizo, the Greek beta is B, alpha is A, pi is P. And you put them all together, you get the word baptize. So you see, you knew some Greek and didn't even know you knew Greek. So when you say baptize, you're saying a Greek word. Go, he said, baptize them, immerse them. And we can understand why that's important when we understand exactly what baptism means. And my favorite place for that is in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Romans 6, chapter first verse, What shall we say then, Paul writes to the church at Rome, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? I know what you meant. <laughs> I know. But what, why did Paul even ask that question? Why? Because people were teaching, hey, Paul, you keep saying we're saved by grace through faith and not by works, but it's a gift of God. Well, if that's true, then... The more I sin, the more I can ask for forgiveness, and the more grace I get. So the more I sin, grace keeps increasing. And so Paul says, what? Shall we go on sinning so that grace can increase? By no means. Why not? Because we died to sin. That's a good one. 
We died to sin. You can't go on sinning. Why not? You died to sin. Huh? What does that mean? I died to sin. Watch. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You can't go on sinning. Why not? Because you were baptized. What's that got to do with it? When you were baptized, you were baptized into his death. You can't go on sinning. We were therefore, watch this, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So you can't go on sinning after you become saved. Why not? Because you were baptized. What that got to do with it? Don't you understand? When you were baptized, you were baptized into His death. And you were buried with Him. Just as He went down in the grave and came up again to the glory of the Father, you go down in the grave under the water and come back up out of the water in order to live a new life that will glorify God. You can't go on sinning. You died to sin. Wow, no wonder it's so important. See, in baptism, we're dying to that old life. It's gone. It's buried. We're leaving it in the water. That's the grave. And we come out of that water a new person. A new creation, the Bible says. I'm a new creature to live a life that will honor and glorify God. You see, that's why it's important to recognize God as the creator. Because it takes the same creative power of God to recreate us into a new creature as it did to create us in the beginning. Only the Creator can do that. Amen. Only the Creator can recreate this world into a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. And if you believe in the theory of evolution or anything like it, then how do you know that when you come out of the water, you are a different person? How do you know that, yes, we still struggle in this old world, in this body of sin, but one of these days God is going to recreate a new body for me in a new heaven and a new earth? How do you know He can do that if you don't believe He's the Creator? You see, these things all fit together. Baptism and Creator. No wonder God gave us two monuments. The Sabbath as a reminder that He's the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And baptism a reminder that He died, was buried, and rose again so that you can live. Amen. The devil has killed two birds with one stone. You see, when man switched the Lord's day from the Sabbath to Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Jesus, now we have a day in honor of the resurrection. And we no longer have a day in honor of creation. And therefore, evolution has crept into the church. It wasn't a coincidence that St. Augustine of Hippo just 60 years after the Council of Laodicea officially decreed that the Lord's Day is changed from the seventh day to the first day of the week, just 60 years later, after that, St. Augustine of Hippo was saying that we have probably evolved instead of what created on the sixth day. Because creation, the, the Sabbath was God's bulwark, His reminder that He's the Creator. But you see, when you keep a day in honor of the resurrection, you don't have a day in honor of creation anymore. But when you keep a day in honor of the resurrection, then baptism loses its meaning. And it becomes watered down and meaningless. 
It's just a symbol. You don't really die. So why all the fuss with the water? Little water, a lot of water, doesn't matter. Just a drop or two will do. You see, baptism, and it's a lot easier on the conscience to be sprinkled with a drop of water and then to go on living the same old life they were living before. Because when you're buried in that water, that means you're dying to that old life. So it's a lot easier on the conscience. Well, I'll just drop a two and I can just go on. Now, I'm not trying to say that everybody baptized by sprinkling did it because they don't want to change their life. That isn't true. Most people don't really know the true meaning of baptism. And they're just following what they believe is right and true. And you know, as long as we're sincere in doing what we believe is right and true, and God honors that. He recognizes that. And I'll show you why in a minute. So a little water, a lot of water, doesn't matter. Just a symbol. See, the problem is when we start rationalizing God's Word, how do you know when to stop? And the, I guess the lesson that I really want to take out of this about God is that He's not like us. A lot of times we say things and, eh, you know, don't even really mean it. But when God says something, He really means it. Because He is the truth. And He knows the truth. And to try to rationalize that truth is to walk down a very dangerous path, a slippery slope, rationalizing. For the first 500 years in the church, they baptized by immersion. But, you know, a lot of the church was out in the desert country. There's not a lot of water out there. Oh, man, that's a lot of trouble. Get that much water together, and it's just a symbol. A little water, a lot of water doesn't matter. Why don't we just get a bucket and dump on top? And so they start pouring. And then perhaps one day a lady comes to be baptized and she said, well, I just came from the beauty parlor with my new hairdo. It's just a symbol, little water, a lot of water doesn't matter. You know, you're going to mess it all up with that bucket on my head. Why don't you just do a drop or two? So they start baptizing by sprinkling. Makes sense. Once you begin to rationalize, you see, how do you know where to stop? I've read some churches in the Orient, they baptize with salt. Other churches, a little oil on the forehead. That's nice, but where does the Bible say to immerse in oil? Dropping even here doesn't immerse. It's not baptism. Sprinkling isn't baptism. This baptism is immersion. I read about one church in Hollywood. Beautiful movie star wanted to be baptized. And she thought it would look nice if they just sprinkle rose petals on her pretty blind hair. So in that church, they baptize with rose petals. I even read about one church where the pastor has everyone being baptized come stand up in front of the congregation and he raises his hand. And he says, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I guess that's the dry cleaning method. How do you know when to stop when you start rationalizing God's Word? It's dangerous to rationalize. I think of two brothers, Abel and Cain, both born in the same godly family, both instructed by the same godly parents. And they understood how God wanted them to worship. He wanted a lamb pointing forward to the lamb of God like we learned last time. Now Abel offered his lamb and God accepted that offering. Cain, his brother, rationalized. He said, well, you know, Abel's a shepherd. Easy for him to get a lamb. I'm a farmer. I don't have any lambs. But I got pomegranates, tomatoes, beets, all this red juice. 
After all, that blood doesn't save anybody. It's just a symbol. So I'll offer some of my vegetables. Now, he was worshiping God, and he thought he was doing the right thing, even though he was rationalizing. The fact that he rationalized meant he thought it was the right thing. But God didn't, and God rejected it. Cain did not believe that God meant what he said when he said, give me a lamb. He substituted his own works, his own idea for the way it should be. He thought it was right. God rejected it. But when God rejected it, he, God rejected his worship. He got so angry that he went and murdered his own brother. Why did he murder his brother? It was over worship. Now, you think that story's in there just to read a bedtime story to your children? Read Revelation 13. Those who worship the beast turn against the ones who worship the Creator and try to destroy and kill them, just like Cain tried to murder his brother Abel. When we attempt to rationalize God's Word, it does something back to us. And it changes those people into something that is willing to kill another person over worship and claim that they're doing it in the name of God. You know, I'm getting into the mark of the beast a little bit, but you see, these are all related. When God said, I want you to give me a lamb, he meant a lamb. When God said, I blessed the seventh day and made it, made it holy, he meant the seventh day. Not the first day, second or third, he meant the seventh day. God means what he says. When God said to Eve and Adam, don't eat that apple in the middle of the garden. I don't know if it was an apple or not, whatever. He said, don't eat the fruit. He meant the fruit from that tree. And he said, well, look at all these other trees. You know, they're okay. And this one looks better than, I think I'll just not eat from that tree there and I'll eat from this one here. Makes sense. But you see, God means what he says. When God told Noah, he said, Noah, I want you to build a big boat because I'm going to destroy this world by flood. Noah built the boat. He didn't rationalize. He didn't say, well, there are a lot of other boats around. I'll get on that one. He could have. No, but he believed God meant what he said. And when we believe God, we're going to do what God says to do. It's dangerous to rationalize. Big, big chief one day walked into the mission on the reservation. And Padre was there doing things. And chief saw a big Bible, saw a big Bible sitting on the, on the desk. And he said, what's that? The padre said, that's the Holy Bible. That's the Word of God. And the chief said, I want to read that book. So the padre let him take the Bible to his home. And every night, every night, he read the Word of God all the way through Genesis to Revelation. And then he came back and he brought that big Bible and he put it back on the top of the desk there and he told the padre, he said, I want to be baptized. And the padre says, good. It's a great thing when somebody wants to be baptized. So he turned around and he opened his cupboard and took out a little cup and a jug of water and put it down on the desktop and poured some water in that cup and the big chief looked at that, stepped back, and he said, too small. <laughs> Too small. And Padre says, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't have to get in the cup. I'm just going to sprinkle a drop from the cup on your head. And the big chief stepped back and looked at the Padre, and he said, if that's the right baptism, then you gave me the wrong book. Because he understood what it meant to be buried in the water after dying with Christ and rising up again to live a new life to glorify God. Well, is it important 
is baptism really all that important? Let's ask Peter. Peter, what do you think? Is baptism important? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, after talking about the flood, Noah building the ark. In verse 21 it said, actually the end of verse 20, in it, that's the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. You say, Peter, you don't really mean that. Baptism doesn't save us. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Not by works, not even baptism. Well, I think if Peter was here to speak for himself, he'd probably say something like, well, you're right. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul has made that crystal clear. But can you claim to have faith in God and not be willing to do what God says to do? Can you claim to believe God and not be willing to obey God? Baptism saves you? We're not saved because we're baptized. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And if we have faith in Christ, then we are going to be baptized. In fact, in one sense, the act of baptism does save you. You say, how do you get that, preacher? Well, Peter said it. This baptism that now saves you not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. How does it save you? It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven and, and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to Him. Baptism saves you. Not your baptism, but His baptism. When Jesus was baptized, remember John the Baptist said, Oh, no, no, not me. I can't baptize you. I'm not even worthy. Jesus said, This must be done in order to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He was baptized for you, not for himself. He never sinned. He didn't need to die to sin. He was baptized for you. He had to die to your sins, not his so his baptism was for you. It becomes your baptism. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, his baptism covers you. So even though you were sprinkled, even though you were salted, even though you were rose petaled or dry cleaned, if you truly and sincerely felt that you were following Jesus in the eyes of God, you are an immersed, baptized Christian because Jesus was immersed for you. Some of you are saying, well, I didn't know about the Sabbath. Have I been sinning all this time? In the eyes of God, if you have been following the Lamb, living up to the light that God has given you, in the eyes of God, you are a seventh-day Sabbath keeper, even though you keep Sunday because Jesus was a seventh-day Sabbath keeper and His life stands in the place of yours. That's what the gospel means or it means nothing at all. But, once you study your Bible and discover, whoa, God didn't bless the first day. He blessed the seventh day. Now what am I going to do about it? Once you study your Bible and discover, wow, sprinkling? That wasn't what Jesus did. He wants me to be immersed. He was immersed for me. Do I believe enough to do it for him? You see, can we accept the, the blood of the Lamb and reject the water of baptism? I don't think so. So yes, His life covers ours, but once God reveals His truth and His way to us, then He expects us to follow. And if we choose not to, can we really claim to believe God? I'm not saved because I got baptized. 
You're not saved because I strive to keep the Sabbath holy. No. I'm saved because I believe God. But can I claim to believe God and not do what He says? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John wrote that he who says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar. I don't want to be a liar. That's why I strive to do what he commands, because I love him. My wife fixes things I like to eat. And she's nice to me. And she does things I like for her to do. Why does she do that? So she can get me to marry her? We're all mar ready married. I love her. She knows I love her. She loves me. I know she loves me. I try to do the things that please her. She tries to do the things that please me, not in order to get us to marry one another, but because we are married, because we love each other, because we want to make each other happy. And I furthermore believe that when I please her, I'm doing the one thing that makes me happier than anything else. And so that's the way it is with God. I don't obey Him because I want Him to save me. He saved me. And because of that, I trust Him. I obey Him. And the bonus is that when I follow Him, I'm doing the things that makes me happy too. He said, I will withhold no good thing from those who walk up rightly. That's the lesson we need to learn about God. You say, well, okay, okay. I'm convinced. Baptism is important, but what do I need to do in order to prepare for baptism? Well, I found three things in the Bible that I think would encompass the preparation for baptism. First one is in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Whoever believes, Jesus says, and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now it's interesting. He says if you believe and is baptized, you'll be saved. You can believe without being saved. Did you know that? The devil believes that God wants us to be baptized, but he isn't going to be saved. The devil believes that Jesus died on the cross. He was there watching it. He believes it, but he isn't going to be saved. So he says, whoever believes and is baptized. You see, both. Because baptism is a visible expression of the in inward invisible faith. But notice, whoever does not believe will be condemned. It, nobody's condemned because they don't get baptized as much as they are condemned because they didn't believe. Just like Eve. Her real sin wasn't so much that she ate the apple. I mean, that was a sin. Don't misunderstand me. But the real sin was she didn't believe God when he said, if you eat it, you'll die. See, the issue is, do you trust God? Do you believe God when he tells you something? Do you believe it? So baptism is for believers, not for non-believers. I'm sorry, it won't help to get one of your friends and toss them into the swimming pool and on the way to the water. You say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It won't help because they have to be a believer. The water's not magic. And then the second thing in preparation for baptism, Matthew chapter 28, we already read it. Jesus said, go and teach them all things. Baptize them, teach them all things. So a person should be taught what it means to be baptized. A person should be taught that when you're going into that water, you're dying to the old life. You're burying it. That old man is dead. You come up a new person, a new creation in Jesus. You can't go on sinning now. You need to live a new life for Jesus. Well, they ought to understand a little bit about that old life they're saying goodbye to and be willing to do it. And they should understand about the new life that they're wanting to live in, in order to glorify God. They should know a little bit at least about what that encompasses and they should be willing to do it. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean when you come out of that water you're perfect and you never make another mistake. It doesn't mean that at all. It simply means that you are willing to live your life to the way God made us. You trust Him. And when you do make mistakes, you say, God, I've sinned. Forgive me. And He says, I already have. <laughs> That's what it means. So you need to understand a little bit about the Christian walk. I think you can tell from this that baptism then is for people who are old enough 
to be able to understand and believe and trust God. Baptizing an infant who can't even believe if he wanted to is not going to mean anything. The Bible doesn't say we baptize infants. That's a tradition that was brought into the medieval church of Rome. No. The Bible says believe. The Bible says be taught. It also teaches that we dedicate infants to God. We dedicate them to God and pledge to raise them to the best of our ability as parents to follow the Lamb so that when they're old enough to make their own choice, then they will want to be baptized and follow the Lamb. But it doesn't help to immerse a baby. That's why they just sprinkle. But that's not baptism. And then the next thing about baptism. In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist was preaching a baptism, in verse 3, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Peter, when he preached on the day of Pentecost, what should we do, they asked him. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. See, baptism should be preceded by repentance. Now, that's a pretty heavy word. What does repentance mean? Or repentance, I think a good way to understand it is to be sorry for sin. But not just in a careless, flippant way, but a heartfelt sorrow. A determination to never do it again. A hatred for it. We had, we had two boys. They're not little boys anymore. They're big men. When they were little, they played together three years apart. The little fella, the younger one, always came out on the short end of the stick when things got rough. He was the one who would get knocked down and hurt. And one time they were roughhousing a little bit too much and the poor little guy got knocked down, hurt, started crying. And so we went to his big brother and said, Now look, you need to go over there and tell him you're sorry. Well, that didn't always go over too big. And sometimes he would just inch his way over there, maybe hoping that we'd forget about it by the time we got there if we took so long. <laughs> and then when he gets there, without even looking at it, he mumbles something that nobody could understand. You see, that's not repentance. Repentance hates sin. I hate it when I do that. I don't ever want to do that again. I got impatient with my family today, God. I hate it. I don't ever want to do it. Help me never do it again. You see, that's what repentance means. Hatred for sin. You say, well, I, I don't know that I always hate everything I do. That's true. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we discover that there may be some sins we might not hate. One part of us does, another part of us secretly, well, you know, that's why I really appreciate the Bible saying that repentance is a gift from God. And you can just pray, God, you know my heart. I can't fool you. I kind of enjoy that, but I don't enjoy it because I know it hurts you and I don't want to do it and I don't want to hurt you. Make me hate it, Lord. Make me repentant. And he'll answer a prayer like that. Just give it to God. So believe in Jesus. Be taught what it means and repent. John the Baptist said to the crowds coming out in verse 7, he said, those coming out to be baptized, you brood of vipers. And be like me having an altar call and you come down front and I say, you bunch of rattlesnakes. What would you think of that? You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? You see, they just wanted to be baptized so they wouldn't burn in hell. Not because they love God. Now watch this, verse 8. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. Ah, oh, well, we're okay, we're saved because we're descendants of Abraham. 
No, Pastor, I don't need to be baptized. My church doesn't do it that way. I got sprinkled. That should be good enough. God can make church members out of stones. You're not saved because you're a church member. You're not saved because you're a Catholic, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Seventh-day Adventist. You're saved because you have faith in Jesus Christ and you're willing to follow the Lamb. That's what saves us. No matter what label we tack on ourselves, no matter what church you go to, you need to follow the Lamb. Now notice, John the Baptist would not baptize everyone that came up to him and said, baptize me. So what should I do? Somebody comes up to me and says, baptize me, pastor. John had a criteria. He said, produce fruit. Show me a little evidence that you really want to die to that old life. He had a criteria. He wouldn't just baptize anyone. He wanted to see evidence of repentance. See, baptism is not a game. It's not just a swimming pool. Sometimes young people you know, say, I want to get baptized. They say, why? Well, I get to go swimming. No, it's not about swimming. It's about dying to that old life. Then sometimes people ask me, what's the urgency, Pastor, about baptism? And I'm going to have a birthday in about eight months, and I think I want to wait till my birthday to get baptized. Or I'm going to wait till I can save up enough money and fly over to the East Coast and see my grandparents and get baptized there. I think they would like to see that. But I don't see that attitude in the Bible. For example, in Acts, the eighth chapter, verse 26, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, who was an evangelist, he said, Philip, go south to that road, and that desert road. And so Philip went down there, and on his way he met an Ethiopian, the treasurer of Ethiopia, important man. Verse 30, Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet, and he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked, how can I understand that? He said, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And Philip explained to him what Isaiah was writing about Jesus Christ. That's an Old Testament book, Isaiah. Read Isaiah 53. That's what he was reading. Read Isaiah 53. It's all about Jesus dying on the cross for you in the Old Testament. And so he studied Isaiah with the man. And as verse 36, as they traveled along that desert road, they came to an oasis or something because they saw water. And the Ethiopian said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And so he gave order to stop the chariot. And both he and Philip went down into the water. Did you get that? They went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. And then when they came up out of the water. So how did he baptize him? He didn't bend down, get a handful, and shoop, I baptize you. No, they went down into the water. He baptized them. They came up out of the water. Now notice he was on his way home. He could have said, well, I'm on my way home. I can go to my own church and get baptized there. No. When the Spirit moves on the heart, it's time to do it, even if you're out in the desert. It's dangerous to put off following what God says. Don't give the devil a chance to put his foot in the door. Because if he gets it open a crack, he'll bust it open all the way. So when God impresses your heart to do something, it's time to do it right then. Now, a person should be prepared. doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but it means you should understand. And once you understand what it means, then it's time to be baptized. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Sometimes people say, well, my birthday is next month. I want to get baptized on my birthday. There is not one verse in the Bible that says, thou shalt wait until thine birthday to get baptized. Not one. When the Spirit moves on the heart, it's dangerous to delay. It's time to respond. It's urgent. 
Acts chapter 22 is another story because people ask me a lot of times, well, what about me? I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for 50 years, and God has used me in so many ways and worked miracles and answered my prayers. And are you telling me I need to be baptized? Well, verse tw chapter 22, verse 6, about noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, do you know why Saul was going to Damascus? He was going to persecute Christians. He was going to put them to death. And then he hears this voice, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, Jesus had been dead for a long time. He was up in heaven. I love this because it tells me whatever happens to you happens to him. Nothing happens to you that Jesus isn't experiencing himself. He understands you. You can trust him. Why are you persecuting me? Now watch this. Verse 10, what shall I do, Lord? Saul of Tarsus, calling Jesus of Nazareth, Lord. He was converted. He was born again right there. He encountered Christ. He was born again. What shall I do, Lord? Get up, the Lord said. Go to Damascus there. You'll be told all you have been assigned to do. God had an assignment for him. He's got an assignment for you. He's just waiting for you to get up and move on it, but he's got an assignment just like he did for Saul of Tarsus. Verse 11, my companions had to lead me by the hand to Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Now, folks, we are looking at a miracle. Amen? And so verse 12, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law. A spirit-filled Christian called a devout observer of the law. The spirit doesn't do away with the law. It intensifies the law in our hearts. Verse 13, he stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Another miracle, isn't it? I have never seen anyone more miraculously converted than Saul of Tarsus. And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, to hear words from his mouth, and you will be his witness of all men of what you have seen and heard. And Saul of Tarsus became Paul, the apostle. Amen. What a conversion. What a miracle. Nobody has ever had a miraculous conversion like that. And yet, verse 16, and now what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized and wash your sins away. After all of that, he still needed to go get baptized, even after receiving his call to be an apostle for Jesus Christ. He still needed to get baptized. If Paul needed to be baptized, then how much do you and I need to be baptized? Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 5, except you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That ought to settle it for us can't see the kingdom of God without the Holy Spirit. But he's also saying we can't see the kingdom of God unless we're born of water. Baptism and the Spirit, the water and the blood of Jesus. We need them both. But just in case you're not convinced, I want you to go with me to the Jordan River and there's Jesus standing on the bank taking off his outer robe, walking down into the water, and said, John, baptize me. John said, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. I can't baptize you. And Jesus said, John, this must be done. If you want to fulfill all righteousness, it must be done. And so John the Baptist baptized Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the muddy water of the Jordan River. Watch Jesus as he comes up out of the water. And he looks up and prays. And the Holy Spirit comes down on him like a dove. 
And he hears the voice of his father saying, This is my son, and I'm happy. And Jesus trudges out of the water onto the bank of the river. See him standing there, water dripping from his hair, his beard, his robe, into a little puddle on the bank of the river. And then he notices a man standing next to him. And he asked the man, he said, have you been baptized? And the man says, no, I haven't been baptized. And Jesus says, well, I was baptized. And the man says, well, maybe it was necessary for you. Well, I don't think it's necessary for me. Makes me feel blasphemous just saying that. Because if it was necessary for the sinless Son of God to be baptized in the waters of the Jordan River, how much more necessary and willing should you and I be to follow the Lamb? Brandon, because you're giving yourself back to Jesus tonight, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Lord, we have just seen it. We've been talking about it, but we have seen it. And all we can do is just stand in awe of all that you have done for us. Lord, as we sit here, the image still in our mind, there are some who have never been baptized that need to take that step. Maybe there are even some who have been baptized, but it wasn't the Bible way. And then perhaps there are some who have been baptized the Bible way, but they have wandered off the path or they didn't understand what it meant. They want to come back home. And Lord, I pray that you'll just search every heart and convict every person who needs to be baptized to take that step and follow the Lamb. Amen. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.